Welcome to the Roundtable once again, and today we're going to be talking about Russia and the energy game that's being played out in Europe and here in America, perhaps here as well. We've got two experts to talk about this as well. Greg Miller, our senior editor at FreightWaves.com, and also Dr. Sal Bracagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University and host of one of the best YouTube channels on the planet, if you get a chance to check that one out. Uh, Greg, let's start with, with you and uh, LNG. And obviously, we've had the shutdown of the pipeline in Russia, um, you know, what that means for Europe. Uh, but, and also, shipping rates for LNG also now are just astronomical. What has that impact been like, and, and what do you see as the future right now for LNG and shipping? Yeah, so so usually uh, about one third of U.S. exports, uh, LNG export cargoes, go over to Europe. Uh, so far this year, about two thirds have gone over there. So there's been a huge rush of U.S. LNG uh, across the, the Atlantic over to Europe. Uh, huge volumes going, and one of the things that's helped Europe out this year is there's been a hole in global demand over in China. Uh, China's had all these lockdowns. And China has gone heavily into coal this year instead for power generation. Uh, so uh, the China LNG uh, consumption has gone down about 20 percent uh, through the summer. And that's allowed more supply to go over to Europe. And so Europe is looking good with its storage right now. Its, its goal is to get up to about 80 percent or higher by the time it hits winter. And it looks like it's getting there. Um, you know, the problem is, is, though, even though it's done everything right, uh, if it's a really cold winter, they're still going to have problems. Uh, at least that's what people are saying. So they can go over to uh, uh, more coal and more nuclear, and they can do some conservation. But uh, if if it's going to, it all comes down to the to the weather. Uh, it, if it's if it's a rough winter, they're going to have some problems. Uh, but for the LNG market, it's been flooding over uh, from the U.S. into Europe, and that's been uh, you know overall uh, the LNG shipping market is doing fantastically. Sal, how do you see this, uh, the, the shutting down of the pipeline affect things geopolitically, especially? Obviously, Russia kind of putting itself into a little bit of an isolationist position as far as, as, uh, as certainly LNG goes. And obviously, with December 5th looming with oil, and we'll get that into that in just a second, uh, it's an interesting position that uh, Putin's putting himself in. Well, I mean, put, Putin put himself in the position of being the savior for Europe. He's basically announced that they can alleviate their LNG problem by turning on the natural gas pipeline, turn on Nord Stream 1, get Nord Stream 2 up and running, and Europe will be freed. And I think Greg makes the key point here that global demand is down in LNG, but if it all of a sudden goes back up, if China, if Japan, if South Korea has a huge demand for LNG, that's going to put Europe in a pinch to get what they need. Uh, we also should mention, too, that this is a really expensive way to fuel the power plants in Europe. I, you know, the pipeline out of Russia ships natural gas. What we're shipping over to them by ship is liquefied natural gas, which means you got to cool it down to 260 degrees, uh, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you have to regasify it. So you have to bring in these big platform vessels to do this because those facilities aren't in place right now in Germany, in the Netherlands, in England. Now they're building them, but this is going to add inflation and cost to an already expensive market in Europe. And so Europe may be in trouble, not just because of the coal, but because of the cost and energy is going to put on them and the economic burden, whereas Russia is offering very cheap gas. All you got to do is turn the pipeline back on. Yeah. Um, Greg, let's shift back over to uh, oil and the EU and the G7 plans concerning Russia. Obviously, we've got a price cap possibly coming on December the 5th, depending on if everybody gets on the same page. This could get messy. Uh, what, is it, what is it that you're seeing right now and how this could affect energy prices on a world stage, not just perhaps in Europe as well? Yeah, I was uh, I was at a conference yesterday, and there were some members of the uh, U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control there talking about this, and and messy is the word for it. Um, you know, uh, what happened was in June uh, the EU came together with a sanctions package, uh, and they said, okay, on December fifth, EU countries are no longer going to accept crude imports from Russia, and on February fifth, EU countries are no longer going to accept uh, products imports. In their case, essentially diesel. And as part of this package, they put in something that said uh, when it comes to EU service providers, including insur marine insurance providers, this also applies to cargoes from Russia to third, third party countries. So, for example, uh, if Russia exported crude after December 5th to China or to India, 
uh, EU service providers, including insurance providers, uh, um, you know, could not participate. And, and then they also said, um, and remember Brexit, of course, uh, the UK is not a part of the EU anymore. They said the e UK insurance providers are going to be part of this as well. And when they said that, uh, you know, the U.S. was like, wait a second here, hold your horses, because if the U.K. marine insurance providers do not provide insurance for Russian crude that goes to China or to India after December 5th, then that essentially is going to shut out most of most of the world's tanker fleet from that business. And then suddenly, and we've talked about this before, suddenly you're not you're gonna have a reduction in crude supplies around the world. And after February 5th, a reduction in diesel supplies. And that's gonna increase the prices in the United States. Uh, and, and that's gonna be bad politically. So we came up, uh, the US came up with this idea of uh, a price cap. Uh, and, the G, and the G7 uh, has approved this uh, as of earlier this month. So the U.S., Canada, uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, Japan, and the U.K., importantly the U.K., uh, and I think Australia has jumped in there. But basically the idea is that uh, if Russia sells oil or products to a third-party country like China or India below a cap that the, the G7 sets, then it's okay for insurance providers, for example, the UK insurance providers to be involved, and it's okay for tankers to carry these loads. Uh, so think about that. The, um, the G7 or the US is essentially saying, we're going to manage uh, the price for Russia, mm -hmm. its geopolitical enemy. Essentially, the idea is to have your cake and eat it too. We want these supplies to go out there to the world, but we want to cut the income to Putin. And uh, there are just so many ways uh, that this is, is, could go wrong and mm -hmm. probably will go wrong. Yeah, uh, just dovetailing beautifully into what I was going to ask the Sal here next. So obviously, what, what is Putin's reaction to a price cap? Obviously, when you talk about sanctions of, of, of a normal variety, you're talking about embargoes and, and limiting exports. And now you're talking about just changing prices. What do you think his reaction is going to be? Well, I mean, he's already undercutting everybody. I, I mean, you look at the crude prices right now, you're talking about 80, 90 for Brent, for w, uh, WTI crude, whereas Ural's going for like $68. So, I mean, he's already undercutting. He's trying to ingrain himself in the market. And as Greg said there perfectly, you know, what, what the US and the G7 want is to keep Russian oil flowing, but Russia not to make a profit off of it. So they're coming up with a price cap. But this is dependent on the 13 P&I clubs and the International P&I Club you know, conforming to this, you know, the, the, the only means they have to get at this is by not insuring the cargo. The problem is Russia could conceivably ship cargo without insurance or they can self-insure or it opens up the Asian Chinese market for insurance all of a sudden. And all, you know, there, there are ways around this, I think, that the G7 has not fully understood yet. And I think what you're going to see is Russia manipulating this. And what they're doing right now, what they have been doing is getting these other markets really hooked on their crude. And, and I think that's going to be the problem is, does the US and the G7 want to be responsible then for cutting off this crude oil, or worse, imposing crude oil that's going to be twice the co cost that some of these uh, countries are buying right now? And, you know, I think Putin is maneuvering this so that the G7 is going to look like the enemy here by imposing this price cap. I, I don't see how this works effectively, because the, the marine insurance industry is going to shift over over to Asia, and they'll find other P&I clubs to ensure this. Greg, how does this work with tankers in, in terms of the rates they have, and also not just the tankers that will move this oil legitimately, but also those that we've talked about in the past that may move it illegitimately or illicitly, uh, you know, say, for instance, like we've seen with Venezuelan tankers or, or Iranian tankers? Yeah, I mean, there's so many complications with making this work uh, because the EU sanctions package that I talked about is actually still in place. It hasn't been changed. Uh, and, and so that still applies to e EU marine insurers. The UK insurers that are so important, that, 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 that you know, these laws still, the, the regulations haven't been in place. This is about December 5th. It's, uh, what is it, September 22nd. Uh, they're loading cargoes, or they're negotiating cargoes for October now. Tankers need to be positioning for cargoes in November now. The time is just too short here. So uh, it, it seems like what's going to happen is there's going to be so much confusion uh, that, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, you know, the private, you know, 
Greek tankers that are carrying Russian crude now are going to have some problems uh, with their UK insurance because this isn't going to happen fast enough. Uh, and there's going to be disruptions. Uh, and there's, there is going to be uh, some of this changeover to the illicit fleet. Um, but all of this disruption is happening at a time when uh, crude tanker rates and product tanker rates are finally doing very, very well. Uh, we have increased demand coming back from COVID with uh, the jet fuel. Uh, just overall demand is coming back. China is going to come back. I, you know, well, I guess that's open to debate, but things are looking very, very good for tankers coming into the winter. Winter is normally a very good time of year for them. Uh, of course, COVID disrupted the seasons the last couple of years, but the market is really, really tight right now. And what's happening is this is going to just throw a monkey wrench into things. And probably what's going to happen is uh, rates are going to go up. Yeah. Uh, you're let, me, let, me, let, me hold you, let me hold you right there for just a second, sure, here, right? Because sure. I got to get uh, Sal one more chat before we get before we get here. Sal, obviously one of the one of the complications here, real quick, and uh, answer as quickly as you can, is that there's a possibility that we could see Russian oil in priced in tiers now, and that could provide opportunity all over the place for a lot of different organizations. Yeah, you know, again, I think Russia is is fighting this war in a way that they're actually doing better than most people think. If you look at a map of Ukraine, you can sit there and make the argument that Russia is doing poorly. But if you look at them economically and you look at what their trade is doing, you look at the strength of the ruble and you look at where the demand is now going for Russian oil. And again, they're shifting oil, uh, they're shipping oil longer distances. We're talking about ton miles here, not just tonnage anymore. And this is really going to help the tanker industry and the Greek tankers in particularly are going to be benefiting from this. So, uh, you know, the G7 can say what it wants. However, the market's going to be pulling this oil in the needs it has. And again, go back to what Greg talked about at the very beginning here. It depends what this winter looks like. If this is a bad winter around the world and energy is in premium supply, this is going to be a big problem with not just LNG, but with oil around the world. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thank you both gentlemen for uh, joining us. This has been an exciting conversation. It's going to be uh, really interesting to, uh, to, to put... Uh, <laughs> Put this together in in terms of all uh, best sure guess. Yeah, sure. Is. Let me. We'll have to uh, end it here, and we'll take off uh, from now. Obviously, we'll continue this conversation later. Right now, let's jump over to Kaylee Nix with weather.